Hi friends. Today we're doing our first official forage to table video. We're super excited about it. Mostly going to be hearing from me today, but uh, <laughs> this is kind of a fun one. This isn't going to be exactly forage to table in the sense of to a uh, finished meal because this is just creating the one element of a meal. In this case, a flavoring. We have tons of these golden oysters in our woods. They are literally just overflowing off the trees and we have been giving them away, trying to dry them, do whatever we can with them to make sure that they get used, but still the majority of them are just kind of shriveling up on the tree. Now, I was trying to think of something a while back to do with these mushrooms and came up with this idea of creating a mushroom bouillon. So a flavor that we could add to soups and stews, uh, maybe to marinades. I've come up with a really good recipe that I'm excited about. I'm gonna share it with you today. We're gonna start though right here with these mushrooms and quickly learn to identify them. Now with any mushroom, use an ID book too. You wanna to be really sure of your mushroom identifications, but don't be afraid of them. I've heard even of some people that head up major schools, wilderness schools, that just don't teach mushrooming. That is a shame because mushrooms are so nutritious, so delicious, they are a bulk food. So in other words, you know, you can go out here and you can forage a bunch of greens, but you're, you're not going to get full in the same way you're going to get by eating a load of these super nutritious mushrooms. And it's not that difficult to learn to ID them. For my family, because I'm basically, I consider myself rather a beginner with mushrooms, I stick to ones I know really well and I can be really safe with. This is one of them. Let's meet these guys quick. I do have a more detailed ID video here on these golden oysters, but we'll go over it here quick and make sure we've got the right mushroom. When we're walking through the woods, we're just looking for yellow. And this yellow is going to tell us that we might be on the trail of some of these golden oysters. You can see some important characteristics here. They're growing on wood. The only time you'll be fooled by that is that they can grow on the base of trees. And when they grow on the base of trees, sometimes it's on roots or parts of that tree that are underground. So it looks like they're coming up out of the ground. To be perfectly safe, just stick with the ones that are growing right out of obvious wood like this. Next, we're noticing that they're growing in groups, in clusters. These are not growing singularly. They are always going to be in groups. Because it's a little awkward to look underneath these, I'm going to take one off and show you the gill structure. What we're noticing here are decurrent gills, so they run down the length of the stem, but you'll notice that these don't do it really aggressively. They come down, but they don't run all the way down the stem. But what we're not seeing is a clear delineation where the gills just stop. So I'm going to mess with this a little bit and see how that would be the gills just stopping. That's not what we have with these guys. Instead, they have that decurrent gill structure. You can see the color of the gills, nice white cream color. In this white you're seeing on these leaves, this is the spores. So we're seeing the spore coloration here. We can see we have nice white spores and you're often gonna find these underneath the older mushrooms because they're gonna spore out and leave that color. See, I can scrape that away a little bit and there's gonna be the regular green leaf underneath. This is such an excellent mushroom for eating. It's not unusual at all to find mushrooms at different stages. So these ones are just about right for eating. You can tell by the color there. These obviously are long, long past good. But here we have some 
that I probably wouldn't usually take home. They're starting to fade in their color, looking a little dusty. Here's a secret though, the bullion that we're gonna make, I often will use mushrooms that are a little bit older. These guys are wonderful for putting right into a saute or just frying up as they are. But these guys, they're gonna have a lot more of a mushroomy flavor, which some people may not prefer. But in the bouillon, that adds a nice depth of flavor. I would not be afraid of using slightly older golden oysters for this recipe today. Do remember though, when we get into the insides of these, when they're older like this, in that stem, there's gonna be a lot of little, I'm not sure of the exact species, some little white kind of maggoty worms. If you're into eating insects, you're golden, just like these mushrooms. But if you're not, then when you take older ones, you're just gonna use the outer parts. Here you can see a bunch of more mature ones. These are at the stage that I would freely use. Well, these ones <laughs> are at the stage that I would freely use for the bullion. But these are at their prime. Look at those. Super resilient feeling, great color, beautiful mushrooms. Still, if you have a choice, go for the freshest looking mushrooms you can find. And whew, this is good stuff, my friends. There's one mushroom that could conceivably be mistaken for this, and that's called the jack-o'-lantern. The jack-o'-lantern also grows on wood. It also grows in groups. It also has decurrent gills, but it is bright orange. It's vibrantly orange. I've only seen it once. It's a lot less common. And to me, it has a completely different look. Check out some photos online and I think you're gonna see that it really is a different mushroom, but we want to attune ourselves to that. So if you're gonna get serious about golden oysters for the next three days, look at pictures of golden oysters online, look at pictures of jack-o'-lanterns online, and that's gonna soak into your mind and really help you to make sure that you have a positive ID. Let's pick some, go inside, and I will show you how to make this. You can make this with any edible wild mushroom you like, but because we're going to be cooking it way down, you'll need a lot of them. First, we're going to chop up our mushrooms. Nothing real precise here. We're going to be breaking them down into smaller and smaller pieces over time. So right now, we just want slices that are, say, a quarter to a half inch thick or so, and six to 14 millimeters if you're anywhere else but the US. I'm gonna fill up this six quart cast iron Dutch oven entirely. I'm taking it inside and putting a stick of butter in there. Substitute olive oil if you want to go vegan. Tuck it down to the bottom of the pot and turn on your heat to medium high. Let it begin to cook down. Now let's prepare five cloves of garlic and half an onion. Onion first into the pan. We're going to slow caramelize it over low heat for a deep flavor. Add some butter and spread the onions out so that they're all touching the cast iron. Keep both the onions and the mushrooms cooking until the onions are quite brown. Then add your garlic.
after your mushrooms cook down and lose much of their moisture, you can let them start to brown. That brown, whether it's on the onions or the garlic or the mushrooms, that's the richness of flavor. When you have them well cooked and some of them are browned, turn off your heat and add your onions and garlic. I'm gonna add some fresh ground black pepper and a tablespoon of Himalayan salt. Because I'm making a frozen bouillon, I can use less salt. If you want it to be shelf stable, you'll have to add a lot more salt. And to be honest, a lot of people prefer more salt than I do. I cook for depth of flavor rather than just top notes, so I haven't made a saltier version. But if you do, leave your recipe in the comments below. Add your mixture to the blender. If you don't have a high-speed blender or other capable appliance, you can hack it to bits with a kitchen knife. But ideally, we're going for a puree. You can try blending as is, but unless there's enough moisture in there, which there shouldn't be because we tried to cook it all off, it's just not going to work, at least not in my blender. So first, I added one cup of water. Not enough. A second cup. That did it. Blended and pureed. Taste test and add anything you think it needs. We're hoping for a very strong concentrated flavor, but remember, it will be diluted if you added water. If you didn't add water, you're ready to spread it out and freeze it. Otherwise, return your mixture to your pot and cook over low to medium heat to evaporate off all the water you added. This might take a little while. You're waiting until it starts to brown on the bottom again and gets a really nice browny smell. Keep scraping the brown bits off the bottom and mix them in for added flavor. Put some cooking parchment or wax paper on a tray and spread your bouillon over it as evenly as you can. Use a knife to score it to about two inch by two inch, that's 50 millimeter blocks. If it's winter, you can put it outside to freeze, or if it's summer, put it in a nice box. The next day, take them out. Break them along your scores. Put them into freezer containers and you're done. To use, just add a cube to your broth, then add more to flavor. These shine in soups and stews when you're wanting a deep umami flavor. It's easy to get top notes when we're cooking, salts or sours or sweets, but more difficult to capture that deep richness that just rolls over your tongue because it's a whole symphony of abundance in your mouth. This bouillon is going to add a dark, buttery, mushroomy flavor to whatever you're cooking. In fact, you can make a quick and delicious bowl of soup by adding one to water, tossing in a few vegetables or beans, add some sausage if you like, and serve. We're making a vegetable soup tonight and enhancing it with the wild mushroom bouillon. Her face says it all. This takes soups over the top. There's something so satisfying about gathering and using wild foods. It's not just that these don't cost a penny, and it's not just that they're more nutritious because they're growing in an ecosystem that has rich, living soil. It's that when we eat wild foods, we become part of the ecosystem we're gathering in. For instance, our footfalls alter the soil with every step, breaking roots, mycorrhizal threads, and 
killing small plants and insects, which leaves food for other beings who dwell in the soil and the leaf litter. Like the deer and the wolf and the other heavier beings, our footfalls become part of the life-death cycle that allows fields and forests to grow and evolve. And as we harvest, we might even remember that our usual way of getting food through groceries and mail order and even farmer's markets is just part of a huge role-playing game we humans are all playing. Most of us lost in the game so that we think it is real and forget that nature is the reality we've come from. And we'll go back to all the rest is just an illusion we humans have woven over ourselves so masterfully that we're fooled by our own fairy tale, unable to see through the veil unless, for a moment, the touch and smell of a mushroom in the forest reminds us of who we really are. Let us know if you give this a try and add your variations in the comments, as well as what mushrooms you use, and if by chance your wanders in the forest lead you to remember something that has long been forgotten, tease us with the remembrance by sharing your experience. Love to you all.